Um, homework one, our deadline uh, section tomorrow. Um, we're going to go through the backpropagation example, which I uh, went through very briefly in the last lecture. Talk about nearest neighbors, which I did in one minute. And also, they're going to talk about uh, scikit-learn, which is this really useful tool for doing machine learning, which might be useful for your final projects. Good to know. So uh, please come to section. All right, let's uh, do a little bit of review of where we are. So we've talked about, uh, we're talking about machine learning, in particular supervised learning, where uh, we start with feature extraction, where we take examples and convert them into a feature vector, um, which is more amenable for a learning algorithm. Um, we can take either linear predictors or neural networks, which gives us scores. Um, and the score is either defined via simple uh, dot product between the weight vector and the feature vector, or some sort of more fancy nonlinear combination. At the end of the day, we have these model families that gives us you know, score functions, which then can be used for classification or regression. We also talked about loss functions as a way to assess the quality of a particular predictor. So in uh, linear classification, uh, we had the zero loss and the hinge loss as p example of loss functions that we uh, might care about. Uh, the training loss is an average over the losses on individual examples. And to optimize all of this, uh, we can use uh, the stochastic gradient algorithm, which um, takes an example x, y, and uh, computes the gradient on that particular example, and then just updates uh, you know, the weights based on that. Okay, so hopefully this should be all you know, review. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the following question. You know, let's be a little bit philosophical here. So what is the true objective you know, of machine learning? Um, so how many of you think it is to minimize the error on the training set? Show of hands. No one? This is what we've been talking about, right? We've been talking about minimizing error on training sets. Okay, well, uh, maybe, that's, um, maybe that's not right then. Um, what about minimizing error, training error with regularization? Because regularization is probably a good idea. How many of you think that's the, that's the goal? Um, what about uh, minimizing error on the test set? Okay, S seems like it's closer, right? Um, you know, test sets, test accuracies are things maybe you care about. Um, um, what about minimizing error on unseen future examples? OK, so the majority of you think that's uh, the right answer. And what about uh, learning about machines? That's the true objective. Who doesn't want to learn about machines? That's actually the true objective. <laughs> now, um, so the correct answer is minimizing error on unseen future examples. So I think all of you have the intuition that we are doing some machine learning. We're learning on data. But what we really care about is how this predictor performs on, in the future. Because we're going to deploy this in a system. And it's going to be the future. It's going to be unseen. Um, and then, but then, okay. So then, how do we do you think about all these other things? Um, you know, training set, regularization, and test set. So that's going to be something we'll come back to um, later. Okay. So there's two topics today. I want to talk about generalization, which is, I think, a pretty subtle but an important thing to keep in mind when you're doing machine learning. Um, and then we're going to switch gears and talk about unsupervised learning, where we don't have labels, but we can still um, do something. So we've been talking about training loss, right? We've, uh, you know, I've made a big deal about you write down what you want, and then you optimize. So the question is, like, uh, is this training loss a good objective function? Um, well. Let's take this literally. Suppose we really wanted to just minimize the training loss. What would we do? Well, here, here's an algorithm for you. Um, so you just store your training examples. okay, And then you're going to define your predictor as follows. So if you see that particular uh, example in your training set, then you're just going to output um, uh, the, out, the output that you saw in the training set. And then otherwise, you're just going to seg fault. You're just going to crash. Right? So this is great. It minimizes the training um, error perfectly. It gets zero loss, assuming your training examples don't have uh, conflicts. But you know, you're all laughing because this is clearly a bad idea. So somehow 
purely following this minimizing training set objective is, uh, error objective is not really the right thing. Um, so this is an example, a, a very extreme example of overfitting. So overfitting is this phenomenon that you see where you uh, have some data, and usually the data has some noise, and you are trying to fit a predictor, but you're really trying too hard, right? So if you're fitting this um, green squiggly line, you are fitting the data and getting zero training error, but you're kind of missing the big picture, which is you know this black curve. Or in reg regression, some of you have probably seen examples where you have a bunch of points, usually with noise, and if you really try hard to fit the points, and you're going to get zero error, but you're kind of missing this general uh, trend. And overfitting can really kind of uh, bite you if you're not careful. So let's try to formal formalize this a little bit more. How do we assess whether a predictor is good? Because if we can't measure it, we can't really um, you know, optimize it. Okay, so um, the key idea is that we really care about error on unseen future examples. Okay, so this is great as you know, um, aspiration to write down. But the question is, how do we actually you know, optimize this? Right? Because it's the future, and it's also unseen. Um, so you know, by definition, we can't get a handle, get a handle on this. Um, so typically, what people do is uh, the next best thing, which is you gather a test set, which is supposed to be representative of the types of things you would see. And then you guard it uh, carefully and make sure you don't touch it too much, right? Because you know, what happens if you uh, start looking at the test set? And you know, the worst case is you train on the test set, right? So you know, um, the test set being a uh, surrogate for unseen future examples um, just completely goes away. Right? And even if you start looking at it and you're you know, really trying to optimize it, um, you can get you know, into this overfitting regime. Right, so really be careful that, and I want to emphasize that the test set is really a surrogate for what you actually care about. So um, don't blindly just you know, try to make test accuracy numbers go up at all costs. Okay. Okay, so, um, but for now, let's assume we have a test set that you know, we uh, have to work with. So, you know, there's this kind of really peculiar thing about machine learning, which is this leap of faith, right? You, the training algorithm um, is only operating on the training set, and then all of a sudden you go to these unseen examples or the test set, and you're expected to do well. So, you know, why is there? Why would you expect that, you know, to happen? And as I alluded to on the first uh, day of class, there's some kind of actually pretty deep uh, mathematical reasons for why this might happen. Um, but you know, rather than getting into the math, I just kind of want to give you a maybe intuitive picture of how to think about um, this, this gap. Okay, so remember uh, we have this picture that it's uh, of all predictors. So these are all the th functions that you possibly want in your wildest dreams. Um, and then when you define um, a feature uh, extractor or a neural net architecture or any sort of kind of um, you know, a, a structure, you're basically saying, hey, I'm only interested in these set of functions, not all functions, okay? And then learning is um, trying to find some element of the class of functions f that you've uh, set out uh, to find. Okay, so there's a decomposition which is useful. So let's take a, this point g. So g is going to be the best uh, function in this class, the best predictor that you can possibly go. So if some oracle came and set your neural net weights to something, how well could you do? Okay, so now there's two gaps here. One is approximation error. The approximation error is the difference between F star, which is the, the true uh, predictor. So this is you know, the thing that always gets the right answer. And G, which is the best thing in your uh, class. Okay, so this really measures how good is your hypothesis class. Remember last time we said that we want hypothesis class to be expressive. If you only have linear uh, you know, functions and your data looks uh, sinusoidal, then that's not expressive enough to capture um, the, the data. 
OK, so the second part is estimation error. This is the difference between the best thing in your hypothesis class and the, the function you actually find. Right? And this measures how good is a learned predictor kind of relative to the potential of the hypothesis class. You define this hypothesis class as um, here are things that I'm willing to you know, consider. But at the end of the day, based on a finite amount of data, you, you can't get to G. You only can kind of estimate. Um, you know, some you do learning and you get to some f hat. So, um, in kind of more mathematical terms, if you look at the error of the thing that your learning algorithm actually returns minus the, the error of the you know, best thing possible, which you know, in many cases is you know, zero, um, then this can be written as follows. So all I'm doing is minus, subtracting r of g and adding r of g. So this is the same quantity as this. Um, but then I can look at these two terms. So the estimation error is the difference in error between uh, the thing that your learning algorithm produces minus the best thing in the class g. And then the difference approximation error is the difference between r of g and r of f star. So this is kind of a useful as a way to kind of conceptualize um, the different trade-offs, right? So you know, just to kind of explore this a little bit, suppose I increase the hypothesis class size, right? So I add more features, or I you know add a, uh, increase the dimension on my you know, neural networks. Um, what what happens? So the approximation error will go down, and why is that? Because we're taking a minimum over a larger set. So um, g is always the minimum possible error over the set f. And if I make the set larger, I have just more possibilities of driving the error down. Okay, So the approximation error is going to go down. Um, but the estimation error is going to go up right? as I make my hypothesis class more expressive. And that's because it's harder to estimate something more complex. So I'm leaving it kind of uh, vague right now. There's a mathematical way to formalize this, which um, you can ask me about offline. Okay, so you can see this kind of tension here, right? You really want to make your hypothesis class large so you can um, drive down the approximation error, but you don't want to make it too large that it becomes impossible to um, estimate. Okay, so now we have this kind of abstract framework. What are some kind of knobs we can tune? How do we control the size of the hypothesis class? So we're going to talk about uh, two essentially classes of um, uh, types of ways. So strategy one is um, dimensionality. So remember for linear classifiers, a predictor is specified by a weight vector. So this is d numbers. right? And we can change d. We can make d smaller by removing features. We can make d larger by adding features. And uh, pictorially, you can think about as uh, reducing d is reducing the dimensionality of your of your uh, hypothesis class. So if you're in three dimensions, you have three numbers, three degrees of freedom. You have this kind of you know, ball, and you, if you remove one of the dimensions, now you have this uh, you know ball uh, or a circle in two dimensions. Okay. So concretely, what this means is uh, you can manually add. Uh, you know, this is a little bit heuristic. You can add features if they seem to be you know helping and remove features if they don't uh, help. So you can um, you know, kind of modulate the dimensionality of your uh, weight vector. Or there are also automatic feature selection methods, um, such as you know, boosting or L1 regularization, um, which are outside the scope of this, this class. Um, maybe if you take a machine learning class, you'll learn more about this, um, this stuff. Um, but the main point is that uh, you can Determined by uh, setting the number of features you have, you can uh, d vary the uh, expressive power of your hypothesis. OK, so the st second strategy is um, looking at the norm, or the norm or the length of a vector. So this one is a, maybe a little bit less um, you know, obvious. Um, so again, for linear uh, uh, predictors, the weight vector is just um, a d-dimensional vector. And you look at how long this vector is. So what is, and the length um, pictorially looks like this. So if you have, um, let's say, all the weight vectors in, um, 
you know, each w can be ex thought about as a point as well. So this circle contains all the uh, wave vectors up to a certain length. And if by making this smaller, now you're considering you know, a smaller number of uh, wave vectors. Okay? So at that level, it's um, perhaps intuitive. Um, so what does this actually look like? Um, so let's suppose we're doing one dimensional linear regression. Here's the board. Um, and we're looking at um, you know, xy. Um, so remember, what in, in one dimension, um, where all we're looking at is um, you know, w is just a single number. Right? And the number represents the slope of this line. So by saying, um, you know, let's draw some slopes here. Okay? Um, so by saying that uh, the weight vector or the weight is a small magnitude, that's basically saying the slope is uh, you know, smaller right, or closer to 0. So if you think about um, you know, slope equals, let's say this is slope equals 1, so w equals 1. So anything, anything, let's say, uh, less than 1 or greater than minus 1 is fair game. And now if you reduce this to half, now you're looking at a kind of a smaller um, window here. And if you keep on reducing it, now you're basically um, converging to you know, essentially very flat and constant functions. Okay, So you can understand this two ways. One is just that the total number of um, possible weight vectors you're considering is just shrinking because you're putting more constraints. They have to be you know, smaller. From this picture, you can also think about it as what you're really doing is um, making the function you know, smoother, right? Because um, a flat function is the kind of the smoothest uh, you know, function. It doesn't kind of you know, vary too much. And uh, a complicated function is one that can go you know, very, uh, jump up very steeply. And you know, for quadratic functions, can also come down really quickly. So you get kind of very uh, wiggly functions. Those are, tend to be more complicated. Okay, any questions about this so far? Yeah. Um, trying to like not overfit. So like, what if we have like latent structures within the data set that since we try that since we try to like not overfit, we're really just kind of like restricting ourselves like a particular set of like distributions that we say, okay, this data must have like come from like something normal, or must have come from something reasonable. But by saying that, we're like not really capturing the full the full like scope of our data sets. Um, not sure. So let's see. So the so the question is if there's particular structure inside your data set. For example, if some things are sparse or you know low rank or something, um, you know how do you capture that with a regularization? Regularization, but you have like. Perhaps not, not even just like price, like sparse vectors. Like if you have like causal models inside, inside between your like parameters, like how would you like? Wouldn't regularization like impede some of those relations? Yeah. So, um, so all of this is kind of very g generic, right? You're not making any as, uh, assumptions about the, the uh, what the classifier is or the features. Um, so they're kind of like big hammers that you can just apply. Um, so if you have models where you have more structure or domain knowledge, or if you, um, which we'll see, you know, for example, if you have you know, Bayesian networks later in the class, then um, there's much more you can do. Um, and uh, this is just kind of you know, two techniques for, as a kind of a generic way of um, controlling for overfitting. Yeah. Make sure I'm understanding correctly. This approach is actually putting constraints on each each element in vector w, like the magnitude of it, versus the other one was actually how many elements are in potential vector w. Yeah. Fair? So um, so let's look at w here. So let's say you're in three dimensions. So w is w1, w2, w3. Um, so the first method just says, okay, let's just kill some of these um, elements and make it smaller. Um, this one is saying that, um, I mean, formally, it's looking at uh, the squared values of each of these and looking at the square root. That's you know, what the norm 
you know, is. So um, it's saying that each of these should be you know, small according to this particular um, metric. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm, I'm going to get to. So uh, this is just kind of giving you intuition for, in terms of hypothesis classes and how you want them to be small. How do you actually um, implement this? Um, you know, there's several ways to do this, but the most popular way is to add regularization. And by regularization, what I mean is take your original objective function, which is train loss of w, and you just add uh, this uh, penalty term. So lambda is uh, called the regularization strength. It's just a positive number, let's say, let's say one, um, and uh, this is the squared length of w. Okay. So what this is doing is by adding this, it's saying that okay, optimizer, you should really try to make uh, train loss small, but you should also try to make this small as well. Okay. Um, and there's a, if you study convex optimization, there's kind of this uh, du um, you know, duality between um, uh, this, this is called the Lagrangian form, where you have a penalized objective, where you add uh, a penalty on the uh, wave vector, and the constraint form, where you just say that I want to minimize train loss with subject to uh, the norm of w being less than some value. But um, this is more the kind of the typical one that you're going to see in um, in practice. Okay, so here's objective function. Great. How do I optimize it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's important that these be the same w, and you're optimizing the sum. So the optimizer is going to make these trade offs. If it says, oh, okay, I can drive the training loss down. But if this is shooting up, then that's not good. And they'll try to balance these two. Yeah. It's, it's basically saying, um, try to fit the data, but not at the expense of um, having huge wave vectors. I'll write that down. Yeah. So if there's another way to say it is that, um, kind of think about Occam's razor. It's saying, if there is a simple way to fit your data, then you should just do that instead of finding some really complicated uh, wave vector that fits your data. So prefer simple solutions. OK, so once you have this objective, um, you know, we have a standard crank we can turn to uh, turn this into algorithm. You can just do gradient descent. Um, and the, you know, if you just take the derivative of this, then you have this gradient. And then you also have uh, uh, lambda w, which is the gradient of this term. So you can understand this as basically you're doing gradient descent, as we were doing before. Um, and now all you're doing is um, you're shrinking the weights towards 0 by lambda. So lambda is a regularization strength. If it's large, that means you're trying to really kind of push down on the magnitude of the weights. So the gradient optimizer is basically going to say, hey, I'm going to try to step in the direction that makes the training loss small, but then I'm going to also um, you know, push the weights towards uh, 0. Um, in neural nets uh, literature, this is also known as uh, weight decay. Um, in you know, optimization statistics, it's you know, known as L2 regularization because this is um, you know, the Euclidean or two norm. Okay, so here, here is another strategy which um, intuitively gets at the same idea, but it's in some sense uh, you know, more crude. Um, so it's called early stopping. And the, the idea is very simple. You just uh, stop early. Instead of um, going and training for um, 100 iterations, you just train for you know, 50. Okay. So why, why, does this, why is this a good idea? Um, the intuition is that you know, if you start with the weights at 0, so that's the smallest uh, you can make the norm of w, right? So every time you update on the training you know, set, Generally, the norm goes up. You know, there's no guarantee that it will always go up, but generally, this is what happens. So, if you stop early, that means you're, you're giving less of an opportunity for the norm to, um, you know, grow. Grow. So, fewer updates translates to generally um, 
lower norm. You can also make this formal mathematically, but you know, the connection is not as uh, tight as the explicit regularization from the previous slide. Okay, so the lesson here is you know, try to minimize the training error, but don't try you know, too hard. Um, yeah, question? Does this depend on how we initialize the weights? Or? Uh, question is, does this depend on how we initialize the weights? Um, most of the time, you're going to initialize the weights from uh, you know, some sort of weights, which is kind of a baseline, either zero or you know, for neural nets, maybe like um, random vectors around zero. But they're pretty small weights. And usually, the weights grow from you know, outside, uh, from small to large. Um, there's other cases where if you um, think about you know, pre-training, uh, you have a pre-trained model, you start with some weights, and then you do gradient descent from that. Um, then you're saying basically don't go too far from your you know, initialization. Yeah? It basically means like we want to, like, uh, the paint should focus on the normal W instead of actually minimizing the train loss. So why are we like, not really focusing on train loss? Right, so the question is, why aren't we focusing on minimizing the train loss, or why focus on W? It's always going to be a combination. So the optimizer is still trying to push down on the training loss by taking these gradient updates. Right? Notice that the, the gradient with respect to the regularizer actually doesn't come in here. It kind of comes in explicitly through the fact that you're stopping it early. But it's always kind of a balance between uh, minimizing the training loss and also making sure you're um, class, classifier weights that doesn't get too complicated. Yeah? How do you decide what value of lambda or t to set? Yeah, so the question is how do you decide the value of t here and how do you decide the value of lambda? So these <coughs> are called hyperparameters, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so here's the kind of the general philosophy. Um, that you should have in machine learning. So you should try to minimize the training error because really that's the only thing you can do. That's your data and that's, you, know, you have your data there. But you should try to do so in a way that keeps your hypothesis small. So try to minimize the training set error, but don't try too hard, I guess, is the, is the lesson here. OK, so now going back to the question earlier, if you notice through all of these, um, my presentation, there's, there's all sorts of properties of the learning algorithm. You know, which uh, features you have, which regularization parameter you have, the number of iterations, the step size for gradient descent. Um, these are all considered hyperparameters. So, so far, they're just magical values that are given to the learning algorithm, and the learning algorithm runs with them. But someone has to set them, and how do you set them? Yeah, you can ask me. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, OK, so here, here's an idea. So let's choose a hyperparameter to minimize the training error. So how many of you think that's a good idea? OK, not too many. So why is this a bad idea? Yeah, you can overfit, right? So suppose you took uh, lambda and you say, hey, um, you know, let's choose a lambda that will minimize the training error. Okay? And the, the learning algorithm says, well, um, OK, you know, I want to make this da go down. What is this doing in the way? Let's just set lambda to 0, and then I don't have to worry about this. So it's kind of um, you know, cheating in a way. And also, early stopping would say, like, don't stop. Just keep on going, because you're always going to drive the training error lower and lower. OK, so that's not good. So how about um, choosing hyperparameters to minimize the test error? How many of you say, yeah, it's a good idea? Yeah, uh, not, not so good, it turns out. Um, so why? And this is, again, stressing the point that the test error is not the thing you care about. Because what happens when you look at the, t uh, we try to use a test set? then it becomes an unreliable estimate of the actual unseen error. Because if you're tuning hyperparameters on the test set, that means that um, it's no longer, it becomes less and less unseen and less future. Yeah? Could you like, like the test set to like have another? 
could, yeah. it's, like a, it's like a cross validation set. Yeah, so we could do cross validation, which I'll describe in a second. OK, so I want to emphasize this point. When you're doing your final project, you have your test set, you have it sitting there, and uh, you should not be you know, fiddling with it too much, or else um, it becomes less reliable. OK, so you can't use a test set. So what do you do? So here's the idea behind uh, a validation set, is that you take your training set, and you sacrifice some amount of it, maybe it's you know, 10 percent, maybe 20 percent, and you use it to estimate the test error. So this is a validation set, right? The test error set is, you know, off to the side, it's locked in a safe, um, you know, it, you're not going to touch it. And then um, you're just going to tune hyperparameters on the validation set um, and use that to guide your model development. The proportion itself is not a hyperparameter. The proportion itself, uh, <laughs> it's a hyper hyperparameter. No, uh, you sh yeah, you don't usually don't tune that. I mean, usually it's it, how you choose it is um, kind of this balance between you want the validation set to be large enough so it gives you reliable estimates, but you also want to use most of your data for training. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you choose the hyperparameters? Um, so the, the answer is you try particular values. So, so you, for example, try, let's say, lambda equals um, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, and then you run your algorithm, and then you look at your validation error, um, and then you just choose the one that has the lowest. Yeah, it's pretty crude, but yeah. A way to choose it to choose like the learning rates and like the hyperparameters without just doing like a like a like a search or like okay, try this one then try this one yeah try so this. how what, is there a better way to search for hyperparameters um, you could do uh, you know, a, a grid search generally is fine random sampling is fine there's fancier things based on Bayesian optimization which might give you some benefits but it's actually the jury's out on that and they're more complicated. Um, there's also, you can use better um, learning algorithms, which are less sensitive to the step size. So you don't have to nail, it's like, oh, point 0.1 works, but like point 0.11 doesn't. So you don't, you don't want that. Uh, but in all of the, the high level answer is that there's no um, real kind of principled way of like, here's a formula that lambda equals, and you just evaluate that formula and you're done. Um, because there's, this is, you know, the, the kind of the, uh, I don't know, the dirty side of machine learning. There's always this tuning that needs to happen to get your you know, good results. Um, yeah, question over there. If uh, turning a parameter all the time just kind of try different values, uh, I was wondering, is this, is this process usually automated or is it still manual? So the question is, uh, is this process automated? Increasingly, it becomes much more automated. So um, it requires a fair amount of compute, right? Because usually, if you have a large data set, even training one model might take a little while. And now you're talking about you know, training, let's say, 100 models. So it can be very expensive. And there's things that you can do to make it um, faster. Um, but I mean, in general, I would advise that don't hyperparameter tune kind of blindly, especially when you're kind of learning the ropes. I think doing it kind of manually and getting intuition for what uh, step size, um, like ch effective step size on your algorithm is still valuable to have. And then once you kind of get a hang of it, then maybe you can automate. But I wouldn't try to automate too, you know, early. Yeah. So with small changes in hyperparameters leads to very big changes in uh, in prediction accuracy. Is that considered uh, indicative of the model not being very robust? Yeah. So the question is, if you change the hyperparameters a little bit, and that causes your um, training or, or model performance to change quite a bit. Does that mean your model is not robust? Uh, yeah, it means your model is probably not as robust. And sometimes you actually don't choose a hyperparameter at all, and you still get varying, you know, model performances. Um, so you know, you should always check that first because there could be just inherent randomness, especially if you're doing neural networks. It could get stuck in local optimum. There's all sorts of um, you know things that can happen. 
Okay, final question and then I'll should move on. Yeah, we found the, the, I guess the optimal hyperparameter. Is it just when they're converging to certain uh, optimal values? Or? Uh, so how do you choose a f uh, optimal hyperparameter? So f you basically have like a for loop that says for lambda in you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, uh, 1, and whatever value is 4, t equals uh, you know, something. Um, you train on the, uh, this, all these training examples minus validation, and then you test the model on the validation. You get a number, and you just use the, uh, whichever setting gives you the lowest number. And we know the number of the I'm sorry? We, we do know the numbers of, uh, it's not just like we're going to keep uh, looking for one uh, hyper or one C, for instance, or one lambda. Yeah, usually you just have to be in the ballpark. You don't have to get like 99 versus 100. The, the things I would just advise is like, you know, let's say what kind of orders of magnitude. Because if it, if it really matters like being down to the precise number, then um, you probably have other worry, things to worry about. Okay, let's move on. So what I'm going to do now is go through a kind of a sample uh, problem, right? Because I think the, the theory of machine learning and the practice of it are actually kind of quite different in terms of the types of things that you have to think about. Um, so here's a simplified named entity recognition problem. So named entity is this uh, recognition is this wide popular task in NLP where you're trying to find names of uh, people and locations and um, organizations. So the input is a string. Um, where which has you know a particular potentially name with uh, the left and right context words, okay, and the the goal is to predict whether um, this X contains you know either a person um, which is plus one or not, okay. So so here's the the, the recipe for success um, when you're doing your final project or something, um, you get a data set. Um, it have, if it hasn't been already split, split it into training, validation, and test, and lock the test set away. And then first, I would try to look at the data to get some you know, intuition. You know, always remember, you want to make sure that you understand your, your data. Don't just immediately start coding up the most fancy algorithm you can think of. Um, and then you repeat. You implement some you know, feature, maybe you change the architecture of your network, um, and then you tune some, you, you set some hyperparameters and you run the learning algorithm, and then you look at uh, the, the training error and validation error rates um, to see you know, how they're doing, if you're underfitting or overfitting. Um, in some cases, you can look at the weights for linear classifiers. Um, and for neural nets, it might be a little bit harder. And then you, I would recommend, look at the predictions of your model. Right? Always have, I always try to log as much information as I have you can so that you can go back and understand what the model is you know, trying to do. And then you brainstorm some improvements. And you kind of do this until um, you either are happy or you run out of time. And then you run it on the final test set and you get your final error rates, which you put in your uh, report. Okay, So let's go through an example of what this might uh, look like. Um, so this is going to be based on the code base for the sentiment homework. Um, so, okay. So here's where we're starting. We're reading uh, a training set. Let's look at this training set. So there are you know seven thousand lines here. Each line contains the label, which is minus one or plus one, along with the input, which is going to be uh, you know the, remember the left context, the actual entity and the, the right context. Okay. All right, so you also have a development or validation set. Um, and what this code does is it, it's going to learn a predictor, which uh, takes the training set and a feature extractor, which we're going to fill out. Um, and then it's going to output either uh, both the, the weights and um, some error analysis, which we can look, use to look at the predictions. And finally, there's this test, which I'm going to not do for now. Okay. So, um, so the first thing is uh, let's define this feature extractor. So this feature extractor is uh, phi of x, and we're going to use the sparse uh, you know, map representation of uh, features. So 
phi, phi is um, there's this really nice uh, convenient structure called default dict. So this is kind of like saying you have a you know a you know a map, but um, you can you know access it, and if the element isn't there, then it returns zero. Um, okay, so phi it goes that, and then return phi. Okay, so this is the the simplest feature vector you can come up with. Um, the dimensionality is zero because you have no features. Okay, so but you know we can run this and see how we do on this. Okay, so let's run this. Um, okay, so over a number of iterations, um, you can see that learning isn't doing anything because there's no weights to update. Okay, so but you know it doesn't crash, uh, which is good. Um, okay, so I'm getting 72% uh, error, which is you know pretty bad. But I haven't really done anything, so um, that's to be expected. Okay, where did my window go? Okay, so now let's um, start defining some you know features. Okay, so remember what is x? X is something like uh, um, took Mauritius into right. So there's this, this entity and left and right. So let's break this up. So I'm going to Tokens equals x dot split, so that's going to give me a bunch of tokens, and then I'm going to define left entity right equals. So this is the f uh, token zero is the left that's going to be took. Um, tokens one through minus one is going to be everything until the last token, and then tokens minus one is the last one. Okay, so now I can define um, a feature template. So remember, a good nice way to go about it is defining feature template. So I can just say entity is um, and blank. Um, that's how I would have write, written it as a feature template. In code, um, this is actually pretty you know, transparent. It's saying I'm defining a feature which is going to be one um, for this uh, you know, feature template. So entity is going to be some value. I plug it in. I get a, f a particular feature value or f feature name. And I'm going to set that feature name to be have the feature value one. OK? So let's uh, run this. Okay, so um, let's go over here, run it. Oh, oops. Um, so entity is a, a, a list, so I'm go just going to turn it into a string. Okay, so now I'm getting um, what happens. So the um, the training error is uh, pretty low, right? I'm oh, Basically, fitting the training error pretty uh, trains that pretty well. But you know, notice I I don't remember I don't care about the training error. I care about the uh, test error. So, just one note: it says test here, but it's really the the validation. Um, I should probably change that. Um, it's just whatever non-training set you passed in. Okay, so this is still a twenty percent error, which is not great. Okay, so um, at this point, remember I want to go back and look at. Um, some you know get some intuition for what's going on here. So let's look at the weights. Okay, so this is the weight vector that's learned. So for this weight uh, uh, feature, the weight is one, and all of these are one, and this you know corresponds to the names that um, the people names that have been seen at training time. Because whenever I see a person name, then I'm going to um, you know, give that feature a one so I can get that training example right. And if you look at the bottom, these are the entities which are, are not people names. Okay, so this is a sanity check that it's doing what it's um, you know supposed to do. Um, so the nice thing about with these kind of uh, really interpretable features is that you can kind of almost compute the what the weight should be in your in your head. Yeah. Like one feature for every almost every example that you have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have one, essentially one feature for every entity, which is almost you know number of times. Right. Yes, so you mean like if like most of them are unique. Yeah. So there's a, a 3,900 uh, features here. And I okay. assume this is what you're going to put down, right? Uh, so we're going to change this, but um, we'll, we'll get we're not done yet. Okay. So, okay. So the other thing we want to look at is um, the error analysis. Okay, so this shows you, here's an example, Eduardo Romero. Um, the ground truth is positive, but we predicted minus one. And why do we predict minus one? It's because this feature uh, 
has weight 0. And why does it have weight 0? Because we never saw this name at training time. Okay? Um, we do get some right. We saw Senate at training time, and we rightly pr uh, predicted that was minus 1. Okay. But you, know, you look at these errors and you say, OK, well, you know, this is um, maybe the, we should add more features. Okay? So if you look, remember this um, you know, example here, maybe the context helps, right? Because if you have governor blank, then you probably know it's a person because only people can you know, be governors. Uh, so let's add a feature. So I'm going to add a feature which is uh, left is left. And for symmetry, I'll just add right is right. OK, so this uh, defines some indicative features on you know, the context. So in this case, it would be took and into. OK, so now I have three feature templates. Let's go and train this model. Um, and now I'm down to I just 11% uh, error. OK, so I'm making some progress. Um, oops. Um, let's look at the error analysis. OK, so now I'm getting this correct. Um, and let's look at what else am I getting wrong. So Smith is blamed. Um, you know, Felix, Mantilla. And you know, again, it hasn't seen um, this exact uh, Actually, maybe it uh, did see this string before, but it still got it wrong. Um, uh, you know, I think there's kind of a general intuition, though, that, well, if you have you know, Felix, um, you know, even if it, you've never seen Felix Mantilla, if you see Felix something, you know, chances are it probably is a person. Um, not always, but uh, as, as we you know, noted before, features are not meant to be like deterministic rules. They're just pieces of information which are useful. So let's go over here, and we want to define, let's say, a feature for every uh, possible word that's in, in entity. So word and entity. Remember, entity is a list of tokens which occur between left and right. And I'm going to say entity contains um, word. Okay. Um, so now let's run this again. And now I'm down to you know six percent error, which is you know a lot better. Um, if you look at the error analysis, um, so I think the maybe the Felix example, and now I get this right. Um, and you know what else? What else can I do? Um, so, you know what I'm kind of this general strategy here I'm uh, following here is, um, you know, which is not always the necessarily the right one, but you start with kind of very. Uh, very specific features, and then you try to kind of generalize, you know, as you go. Um, so how can I generalize this more, right? So if you look at um, worker, so Kurdistan, right? If a word ends in stan, um, or then, I mean, may maybe it's uh, less likely to be a person. I actually don't know, but you know, maybe like suffixes and prefixes, um, you know, are uh, helpful too. So um, I'm going to add features. Let's say entity contains prefix, and then I'm going to let's say just you know heuristically look at the first four tokens um, and suffix the last four tokens, um, and then you know run this again, and now I'm down to you know four percent error. Um, okay, I'm probably going to you know, st stop right now. Um, at this point, you can um, actually run it on your test set. And we get 4% um, you know, error as well. Yeah? Have you ever been in a situation where you added a feature that would have caused the test set to go up? Oh, yeah. I guess um, this was um, all planned out so that the test error would go down. but. Actually, more often than not, you'll add a feature that you really, really think should help, but it doesn't help for whatever reason. So that would usually just cause the 
cause the tester to like not get worse, right? Will it ever cause it to like sorry, not get better, but will it ever ca ca cause it to get worse? Um, yeah, you you. Yeah, some of the time you, it, it doesn't move. Um, that's kind of probably the more of the time. But sometimes it can go up if you add a really you know bad feature. Could, could the algorithm just like find a way to say they don't consider this at all? You know, like say zero. So the more features you add, generally the training error will go down, right? So all the algorithm knows is like it's driving training error down. So it doesn't know that it doesn't you know generalize. Yeah. Okay. So this is definitely the happy path. I think when you go and actually do machine learning, it's going to be more often than not, uh, the test error will not go down. So don't get too frustrated. Um, just keep on trying. Yeah. yeah. Are we expected to keep optimizing after like 5% error? Um, are you expected to optimize after 5% error? Um, it's, it really depends. Um, um, you know, there's kind of a limit to every data set. So data sets have noise. So sometimes you, you should definitely not optimize below the noise uh, limit. So one thing that you might imagine is, for example, um, you have an oracle, which uh, let's say it's um, human agreement. Like if your data set is annotated by humans, and if humans can't even agree like 3% of the time, then you can't really do better than 3% of the time. As a general rule, there are exceptions. But. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So in this recipe, uh, you kind of do all your training, you're happy, and then you, you see the test error. Um, <coughs> then in, say, a real application, say, in the end, then you try on the test set, and you find it's not good. And what do you do? Oh, yeah. What happens if you accidentally uh, if you try on the test set, and it's not good? Um, that's you just say that it's not good <laughs> at some level. So there's many things that could happen. One is that your test set might actually be different for whatever reason. Maybe it was collected in a different day, and uh, your, your performance just doesn't you know, hold up on that test set. Um, in that case, well, that's your test error. right? Remember, the test error is just, if you didn't look at it, it's really an honest representation of how good this model is. And if it's not good, well, that's just the truth. It wasn't, your model is not that good. In some cases, there's some like bug, like something was misprocessed in a way, and it wasn't really fair. So you know, there are cases where you want to like investigate. If it's like way off the mark, if I had gone like seventy percent error, then maybe something was wrong, and you would have to go investigate. But if it's in the ballpark and whatever it is, that's kind of what um, you have to deal with, right? So. What you want to do also is make sure your validation error is kind of representative of your, of your test error so that you don't have you know, surprises at the end of the day. Right. I mean, it's, I think, fine to run it on a test set um, just to make sure that it, there's no catastrophic problems. But the, the kind of aggressive tuning on a test set is something that would you know, heavily uh, warn against. Um, yeah. Any sort of standard as to how you should split the data into train va um, validation and testing? In terms of like how, what percentage of your data you should allocate to each one, just randomize it? or? Um, yeah, so the question is how do you split uh, into train validation and test? Um, it, it depends on how large your data set is. So, so generally, people. Um, you know, shuffle the data and then randomly split it into test validation and, and train. Um, maybe let's say like 80%, 10%, 10%, just as a kind of a, a rule of thumb. There are cases where you don't want to do that. Um, there's cases where you, for example, want to train on the past and test on the future because that simulates the more realistic settings. Um, remember, the test set is meant to kind of be representative as possible of the situations that you would see at in the in the real world, yeah. If it had like seven thousand examples or something, yeah. all like labeled plus one or minus one, do you have to do that manually? Um, so the question is, the data set was um, labeled. There's seven thousand of them. Um, I personally did not label this data set. This is a standard data set that uh, someone labeled. Um, you know, sometimes these data sets come from um, you know crowd workers. Sometimes they come from you know. Uh, experts, um, yeah, it really varies. 
um, yeah, sometimes they come from grad students. It's actually a good exercise to go and label. I've labeled a lot of data, you know, also in my life. Um, yeah, exactly. OK, let's go on. So switching gears now, let's talk about unsupervised learning. So, so far we've talked about supervised learning where the training set contains input-output pairs. So you're given the input, and this is the output that your predictor should output. Um, but, you know, uh, this is very uh, timely. Um, we were just talking about how fully labeled data is very expensive to obtain because, you know, 7,000 is actually not that much. You know, you can often have, you know, 100,000 or even a million examples, which uh, you do not want to um, be sitting down and annotating yourself. Um, so here's another possibility. So unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning, the training data only contains inputs. And unlabeled data is much cheaper to obtain in certain situations. So for example, if you're doing text classification, you have a lot of text out there. People write a lot on the internet. And you can easily download you know, gigabytes of text and all that is unlabeled. And if you can do something with it, that would be, you know, you turn that into gold or something. Um, and also images, videos, um, and so on. Um, you know, it's not always possible to obtain unlabeled data. For example, if you have, you know, some device that is producing uh, data, and you only have one of that device that you built yourself, then, you know, you're not going to be able to get that much data. But we're going to focus on a case where you do have basically infinite amount of uh, data, and you want to do something with it. Um, so here's some examples I want to share with you. This is a classic uh, example from NLP that goes back to um, you know, the early 90s. So this idea is word clustering. The input, you have a bunch of raw text, lots of news articles, and you put it into this algorithm, which I'm not going to describe. But I'm going to look at the, we're going to look at the output. So what is this output? It returns a bunch of clusters where for each cluster, it has a certain set of words associated with that cluster. Okay, and you look at the clusters, they're pretty coherent. So this is roughly, the first cluster is days of a week, second cluster is months, um, third cluster is some sort of uh, you know, materials, um, um, fourth cluster is uh, synonyms of like you know, big and so on. And you know, one, th one thing, uh, the critical thing to note is that the input was just raw text. Nowhere did someone say, hey, this, these are days of the month. Learn them, and I'll go test you later. It's all unsupervised. So this is actually, um, you know, on a personal note, the kind of the, the, the uh, example when I was doing a master's uh, that got me into doing NLP research. Because I was looking at this, and was like, wow, you can actually take unlabeled data and actually mine really interesting kind of signals you know, out of it. Um, more recently, uh, there's these uh, things called word vectors, um, which do something very similar. Instead of clustering words, they embed words in, uh, into a vector space. So if you zoom in here, um, each word is associated with a particular position. And uh, s words which are similar actually happen to be close by in vector space. So for example, these are country. Um, names, these are uh, pronouns, these are you know, years, months, and so on. Okay? So this is kind of operating on a very similar principle. Um, there's also contextualized word vectors like um, Elmo and Bert, if you've you know, heard of those things, which have been really taking the NLP community by storm more recently. On, on the in, in, uh, vision side, you also have uh, the ability to do unsupervised learning. Um, so this is an example from 2015, where you run um, a clustering algorithm, which is also jointly learning the features you're in this kind of deep neural network. And it can identify um, different types of digits, zeros, and nines, and fours that look like nines, um, threes, and, or fives that look like threes, and so on. So remember, this is not doing classification. right? You're not. Um, uh, telling the algorithm, here's our fives, here's our twos. It's just looking at examples and finding the structure that, oh, these are kind of the same thing, and these are also the same thing. And sometimes, but not always, these clusters actually correspond to labels. 
Um, so here's another example of um, um, ships, um, planes, and birds that look like planes. Um, so you can see kind of this is not doing classification. It's just kind of looking at visual similarity. OK? All right, so the general idea behind unsupervised learning is that you know, data has a lot of rich latent structure in it. And that, by that mean, I mean there's, there's kind of patterns in there. Um, and we want to develop methods that can discover this structure you know, automatically. So there's multiple types of unsupervised learning. There's clustering, dimensionality reduction. Um, um, but we're going to focus on you know, clustering, in particular k-means clustering, for um, this lecture. OK, so let's get into uh, it more formally. So the definition of clustering is as follows. I give you a set of points, so x1 through xn. And you want to output an assignment of each point to a cluster. And the assignment variables are going to be z1 through zn. So for every data point, I'm going to have a zi that tells me which of the k clusters I'm in, 1 through k. Okay? So pictorially, this looks like this on the board here, where I have, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say I have seven points. Okay, And if I give you only these seven points and I tell you, hey, I want you to cluster them into two clusters, you know, intuitively, you can kind of see maybe there's a left cluster over here and the right cluster over here. Okay, um, But how do we formulate that kind of mathematically? So um, here's the k-means objective function. So this is the principle by which we're going to derive uh, clusterings. Okay, so k-means says that um, every cluster, there's going to be two clusters, is going to be associated with a centroid. Okay, so I'm going to draw a centroid in um, a red square here. And the centroid is a point in the space, along with uh, you know, the, the data points. And um, I'm going to th this is kind of representing where the cluster is. And then I'm going to associate each of the points with a particular centroid. So I'm going to denote this by a blue arrow pointing from the point into the centroid. Um, and you know, these two quantities um, are going to kind of represent the clustering. I have the locations of the clusterings in red, and also the assignments of the points into the clusters in, in blue. OK, so of course, neither the red or the blue are known. And that's something we're going to have to optimize. OK, so but first we have to define um, what the optimization uh, objective function is. Um, so intuitively, what do we want? We want each point of phi of xi to be close to the centroid, right? For the centroid to be really representative of, that, of the points in that cluster, that centroid should be close to all the points in that cluster, OK? So this is captured by this objective function, where I look at all the points. For every point, I measure the distance between that point and um, the centroid that that point is associated with it. So remember, zi is a number between 1 and k. So that indexes which of the mu um, mu1 or mu2 I'm talking about, and I'm looking at the square distance between those two, the centroid and the point. Yeah? Get assigned to a centroid? Yeah, how does each point get to assign to a centroid? So that's going to be specified by the z's, which um, is going to be optimized over. A priori, you don't know. Yeah? So we always have a pretty good idea of how many uh, labels they could for, I guess. How many clusters? How many clusters it could be. Yeah, the yeah. question is, do we know how many clusters there are? Um, in general, no. Um, so there are ways to select. It's another hyperparameter. Um, so it's a, a something that you have to set before you run the k-means object function. So um, when you're tuning, you try a different number of clusters and see which one kind of works better. OK, so we need to choose the centroids and assignments jointly. So you know, this, this hopefully is clear. You just want to find the assignment z and the centroids 
mu to make this number as small as possible. So how do you do this? Um, well, let's, let's uh, look at a simple one-dimensional example, and let's try to build up some intuition. Okay. So we're in 1D now, and we have four points. And the points are at, um, they're going to be at 0, uh, 2, um, 10, and 12. Okay? So I have a points, four points at these locations. Okay? I want a cluster. And intuitively, you think I want two clusters here. Um, there's going to be two centroids. And suppose I know the centroids. Okay. So I just someone told you magically um, that the centroids on this example is are going to be like at one and eleven. Okay. So if someone told you that, and now you have to figure out uh, the assignments. You know how would you do this? Well, let's assign this point. Where should it go? You look at this distance, which is one. You look at this distance, which is eleven. Uh, which was smaller, one is smaller, so you say, okay, that's where I should go. Same with this point, one is smaller. For these, 11 is smaller, and that's it. Okay, so mathematically, you can see it's comparing the distance from each point to um, each of the centers and choosing the center which is closest. Okay, and you can convince yourselves that that's the way to, if the cluster centers were, centroids were fixed, how you would minimize the objective function. Because if you choose a center which is farther away, then you get just you know, a larger value. And you want the value to be as small as possible. OK. I don't know why this is 2. I think this should be 1, right? OK. Anyway, I'll fix that. Um, OK, so let's do it the other way now. Suppose I now have the, the assignments. So I know that these two should be in some cluster. These two should be in a different cluster, cluster 2. And now I have to place the, the centers. You know, where, where should I place this? Should I place it here? Um, should I place it here? Should I place it here? You know, where should I place it? And if you look at the, uh, the slide here, um, what you're doing is you're saying, OK, for the first cluster, I know 2 and 0 are assigned to that cluster. And I know that the, the, the sum of the distances to this, um, this centroid uh, mu uh, is this. And I want this number to be as small as you know, possible. Okay? And if you did the first homework, you know that you know, whenever you have one of these kind of squared up sum objectives, um, you should be averaging the points um, here. So you can actually solve that in closed form. And you, given the assignments here, you know the center should be there, which is an average of 0 and 2. And for these, this cluster, uh, you should average the two points here, and that should be at you know, 11. Okay, so what's the difference between centroid and assignment? So when you're clustering, you have uh, k clusters. So there's k centroids. So in this case, there's two centroids. There, th those are the, the red. The assignments are the association between the points and the centroid. So you have n assignments. With, and these are the things in blue. Yeah. Um, is the k a hyperparameter, or is that somehow? Yeah, so k here is a hyperparameter, which is a number of clusters, which you can tune. OK, so here's a chicken and egg problem, right? Um, if I knew the centroids, I could pretty easily come up with assignments. And if I knew the assignments, I could come up with the centroids. But I don't know either one, so how do I get started? So the key idea here is alternate minimization, which is this general idea in optimization, which is usually uh, um, you know, not a bad idea. Um, 
And the principle is, well, you have a hard problem. Maybe you can solve it by tackling kind of two easy problems um, here. So here's a k-means algorithm. So uh, step one is you're going to, uh, you're given the centroids. Now kind of going to more general notation, mu1 through mu k. And um, I want to figure out the assignments. So for every data point, I'm going to assign that data point to the cluster with the closest centroid. So here I'm looking at all the clusters, 1 through k, and I'm going to test how far is that point from that centroid. And I'm just going to take the smallest um, value, and that's going to be where I assign that point. Step two, flip it around. You're given the cluster assignments now, z1 through zn. And now we're trying to find the best centroids. So what centroids should I pick? So now you go through each cluster, 1 through k. And you're going to set the centroid of the kth cluster to the average of the points assigned to the cluster. Right, so mathematically, this looks like that. You just sum over all the points i which have been assigned uh, to cluster k. And you, add, you basically add up all the, uh, the feature vectors. And then you just divide by the number of things you uh, summed over. OK? So putting it together, if you want to optimize this objective function, the k-means reconstruction and loss, um, first you initialize mu1 to mu k randomly. Um, there's many ways to do this. Um, and then you just iterate, set the assignments given the clusters, uh, centroids, and then set the centroids given the, the cluster assignments. Just alternate. Yeah? Um, so I can see how this makes sense for like coordinates or like images where like if you read in a similar image by bytes, it looks the same. But for like words where words that are spelled totally differently can have like these same like semantic meanings. Mm -hmm. How do you accurately map them to like a same location to cluster a centroid around? Yeah, so the question is like maybe for images, um, distances in you know, pixel space makes kind of more, more sense. But if you have words, then um, you know, two words which uh, you shouldn't be looking at like the edit distance between you know, the, the words. And two uh, synonyms like big and large look very different but they're somehow similar. Um, so this is um, something that word vectors you know, address, um, which we're not going to you know, talk about. Basically, you want to um, capture the representation of a word by its context. So the context in which big and large occur uh, is going to be kind of similar. And you can construct these context vectors that give you a better representation. But we can talk more offline. Yeah. Is this one of those things where you could get stuck at like a local minima, or are you yes. guaranteed if you do it enough times you get? Like, yeah, uh, you can get stuck, and I'll show you an example. <coughs> okay. Any other questions about the, the general algorithm? Yeah. Um, could it ever be like unstable, and then let's say you get stuck, and then like you or like the like multiple like op, like it might be a yeah yeah like yeah. I'll, maybe I'll I'll answer that. Uh, I'll show you an example. Yeah. I think here you show that you're doing a fixed number of iterations, but can you do some kind of criteria like it doesn't change anymore as a stopping condition? Yeah. So uh, this is going up to a fixed number of iterations t. Um, typically, you would have some sort of you would monitor this objective function, and once it uh, gets below, stops changing very much, then you just stop. Um, actually, the, so the k-means algorithm is guaranteed to always converge to a um, local minimum. So I, why don't I just show you this demo, and I think it'll be make some things clear. Okay, so here I have a bunch of points. Um, so this is a JavaScript demo. You can go in and play around and change the points if you want. It's linked off the, the course website. Um, and then I'm going to run k-means. Okay, so I initialize with these three uh, centroids. And um, these regions are uh, basically the points that would be assigned to that um, uh, centroid. So this is a Voronoi diagram of uh, uh, these, these centroids. Okay, and this is the loss function, which should hopefully should be going down. Um, okay, so now I iterate. So iteration one, I'm going to assign the points to 
uh, the clusters. So these get assigned to blue, this one gets assigned to red, these gets assigned to green. Um, and then uh, the step two is going to be optimizing the centroids. So given all the blue points, I put the center in the smack in the middle of these um, blue points. Uh, and then same with green and red. Um, notice that now these points are in the red region. So if I reassign, then these become red. And then I can iterate and then you know, keep on going. And you can see that the algorithm you know, eventually you know, converges to uh, clustering where these points are blue, these points are red, and th these are green. Um, and if you keep on running it, you're not going to make any progress because if the assignments don't change, then the cluster centers are going to change either. Okay. Um, so um, let me actually you know, skip this since I'm, I was just going to do it on the board, but I think you kind of get the idea. Um, so let's talk about this, a local minimum problem. So k-means is not guaranteed, is, is, is guaranteed to converge to a local minimum, um, but it's not guaranteed to confine a global minimum. So if you think about this as a toy uh, visualization of the objective function, you know, by going downhill you can get stuck here, but it won't get uh, to that point. So just as an example, uh, for different random seeds, um, you can, let's say you uh, initialize here. Okay, so now all the three centers are here, and if I run this, and I run this, now I get this other solution, which is actually a lot worse. Remember, the other one was 44, and this is 114. And that's where the algorithm converged, and you're just you know, stuck. So in practice, um, people typically try different initializations, run it from different random points, and then just take the best. Um, there's also a, a, a particular way of initialization called k-means plus plus, where you put down a point and you put down a point which is as far this away as possible, and then as far as away as possible, and then that kind of spreads out the centers so they don't kind of inter interfere with each other, and that uh, generally works pretty well. But still, there's no necessary guarantee of converging to the global optimum. Okay, any questions about k-means? Yeah? How do you choose k? How do you choose k? You guys love these hyperparameter tuning questions. Um, so uh, one thing you can kind of draw is uh, the following picture. Um, so k, and then your loss that you get from k. And usually, if you have one cluster, the loss is going to be very high. And that at some point it's you know going to go down, and you generally uh, you know lop it off when it's you know not going down by very much. So you can monitor that curve. Another thing you can do is you have a, a validation set, um, and you can measure reconstruction error on that you know validation set, and choose the minimum based on that. So it's just another hyperparameter that you can do. Yeah. Calculated in the demo. How is the training loss calculated? Uh, so the training loss is this quantity. Um, so you sum over all your you know, points, and then you look at the, the, the distance between that point and the assigned centroid, and you square that, and you just add all those numbers up. OK, so to wrap up, um, oh, actually, I have, shoot, I have more slides here. Um, so. Um, unsupervised learning, you're trying to leverage a lot of data, and we can kind of get around this difficult optimization problem by you know, doing this alternative minimization. So these will be quick. Um, so just to kind of summarize the learning section, we've talked about feature extraction. And I want you to think about the hypothesis class that's defined by a set of features. Um, prediction, which uh, boils down to kind of what kind of model you're looking at. For classification and regression, supervised learning, you have linear models or neural networks. And for clustering, you have you know, the k-means object, um, objective. You have uh, loss functions, which you know, in many cases, all you need to do is compute the gradient. Um, and then there's generalization, 
which um, is what we talked about for the first half of this lecture, which is really important to think about. You know, the test set, remember, is kind of only a surrogate for unseen future examples. Um, so a lot of these ideas that we've presented are actually quite old. So the idea of uh, least squares you know, the, for regression goes back to you know, Gauss when he was you know, solve, trying to solve some astronomy problem. Logistic regression was you know, from statistics. Um, in AI, there was actually some learning that was done, even in the, you know, in the 50s, uh, for playing checkers. Um, as I mentioned, the first day of uh, class, um, there was a period where learning kind of fell out of favor. Um, but it came back with um, back propagation. And then much of the 90s, actually, a lot more kind of rigorous treatment of optimization and you know, formalization of when algorithms are guaranteed to you know, converge. Um, that, that happened in the 90s. And then um, in the 2000s, you know, we know that uh, people looked at kind of structure prediction, and um, there was a revival of neural networks. Um, some things that we haven't covered here are you know, feedback loops, right? So learning assumes kind of the static view where you take data, you train a model, and then you go and generate predictions. But if you deploy the system in the real world, those predictions are actually going to come around and be data. And those feedback loops can also cause you know, problems that you might not be aware of if you're only thinking about, ah, here's I'm doing my machine learning thing. Um, you know, how can you build classifiers that don't discriminate? So um, we uh, often have classifiers, you're minimizing the training set, average of a training set. So by, by kind of construction, you're trying to drive down the losses of you know, m kind of common examples. But often you get these situations where minority groups actually get you know, pretty high loss because they look different and almost look like outliers, but you're not really able to um, fit them. But um, the training loss doesn't kind of you know, care. So there's other ways. Um, there's techniques like distributionally robust optimization that try to um, you know, get around some of these issues. Um, there's also privacy concerns. How can you learn, actually, if you don't have access to an entire data set? So there's some techniques based on randomization that can help you. And then interpretability, how can you understand what you know, the algorithms are doing, especially if you have a deep neural network? You've learned a model, um, and there's you know, work which um, I am happy to discuss with you offline. So the general, so we've concluded three lectures on machine learning, um, but I wanted you kind of to think about learning in the most general way possible, which is that you know programs should improve with you know ex experience, right? So I do, I think we've talked about you know linear classifiers and all these kind of nuts and bolts of basically reflex models, but. In the next uh, lectures, we're going to see how learning can be used in state-based models and also you know, variable-based models. OK, with that, so that concludes. Um, next week, uh, Dorsa will be giving the lecture on state-based models.